It's been a while since I posted one of these videos. That wasn't intentional. Uh, there's, I just had a lot of other things going on in my life, but uh, we've been posting new RSS TVs, and I thought it would be good to post on this channel as well. And to kind of tie it into the blog that I keep uh, updated fairly regularly, it's at uh, rickyshoresingstheblues.tumblr.com. And um, I'd like to go over my top 10 films of 2014. 2014 was kind of a disappointing year for film. 2013 had several movies that I, I just were unbelievable. Inside Lewin Davis, Nebraska, The Wolf of Wall Street, even Francis Ha, Behind the Candelabra. There were some amazing films in 2013. But 2014, I feel like all the best movies were sort of flawed in some way. But, um, you know, I like flaws, and sometimes that makes them more exciting. And um, I usually I don't rank them. I put them in alphabetical order on my blog, but I figured this would be more palatable to the YouTube audience if I counted them down, even though I, I don't even know if this is the order that I actually like them. Okay, so number 10, Tracks, directed by John Curran. This is about um, Robin Davidson's memoir about traveling across the Australian desert with uh, three camels and her dog and uh, it's like a nine month trip and it's Mia Wasikowska plays the lead and it's a really very beautiful movie the scenery is beautiful and there's something in Wasikowska's performance of loneliness that was very poignant to me and I, it was a very very good movie beautiful but there's a well I don't want to get into spoilers but there's a really sad scene at the end that I, I told Marissa about and I was like you can't watch the movie you're gonna freak out so she didn't see it but um we both watched Foxcatcher and we loved it, so that's number nine. And a lot of publicity has been given to Steve Carell's performance as John DuPont. This is a true story about uh, these brothers, Mark Schultz and Dave Schultz. They're some, they're, they were wrestlers and they're uh, Olympic gold medal winners. And they, they sort of come under the wing of the sinister rich guy. And it's... I didn't really like Bennett Miller's previous two films, Capote or Moneyball. Moneyball's okay. I think the script was better than 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 the movie. Um, I like Jonah Hill in it. But anyway, Bennett Miller, he, I, I kind of saw him as sort of maybe a, a David Fincher wannabe, but uh, he won Best Director at Cannes for this, for Foxcatcher. That was pretty impressive. But, I, you know, it, I still, <clears throat> I didn't know if I'd like the movie or not. And, you know, I was just like entranced. But one thing that bothered me... It, and I don't want to spoil the movie, but it's it's based on a you know a true crime, and the criminal is sort of portrayed as a devil, and the the victim is a saint. And sometimes these are these are legal hurdles uh, about making movies about people who are still alive or, or whose families could could sue the producers. So I don't know. Sometimes I think the characterizations might have been a little limited, but the movie really gets you into a hypnotic state, and it's 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 awesome. And so number eight, uh, Ida or Ida. Uh, I don't know how you, how you pronounce it. I think it's Ida. But um, this movie has been given a lot of publicity from critics. It's been on a lot of top ten lists. It's a beautiful Polish film directed by Paweł Polakowski from... Uh, um, he's made like three or four movies before this, and this is sort of his breakthrough. And it's interesting because it was recently nominated for Best Foreign Language Film and uh, a, a Polish group has uh, demanded that the producers add context about the German occupation uh, during World War II of Poland, because that's what the movie, that's, that's the, during, that, what the movie is about the aftermath of World War II in Poland, and I don't want to get too into specifics, because it's, it's a complicated story, and it's, it's a very beautiful story, so you should watch it. Richard Brody recently from The New Yorker wrote a blog about, well, when he reviewed it, he said that uh, it was vague, and, um, you know, he hated the movie, and uh, he was one of the few critics who had a dissenting voice, and I bet he's he's kind of happy about this recent controversy because it sort of I don't know backs up his point. But anyway, number seven, it felt like love, directed by Eliza Hitman. This is an independent movie. She's a New York filmmaker. It's about this young girl, and she's sort of uh, it's coming of age story. And photography might recall Terrence Malick, but you know. 
it's kind of a cliche to say that this is like Terrence Malick because what does he own that kind of photography? But anyway, you know the kind of thing where characters are walking through brush and or by the beach or something like that handheld camera work but she hitman pulls it off beautifully and uh, the performances are also natural this is like watching a documentary and uh, a lot of New York films are like that they're much better than Hollywood films um, or off Hollywood films um, so number six this was a uh, polarizing movie Lars von Trier's Nymphomaniac the full uncut version uh, this movie is incredible. I don't even mind Shia LaBeouf in it. The guy is really annoying, but um, sometimes on screen, I, I don't mind. And you know what? Like, I used to hate him. And then when he pulled all this recent BS with, you know, ripping off Daniel Klaus and stuff, it just made him seem like so much more of a douchebag. But then I started to, to think, well, you know, at least he has decent taste. I don't know. But, um... Number five, Only Lovers Left Alive, directed by Jim Jarmusch. Uh, sometimes, Jim Jarmusch is one of my favorite filmmakers. Down by Law and Stranger Than Paradise are in my top 15 films, which I recently posted a list of my top 80 films on. Um, I posted a link to it on my blog. But um, uh, Only Lovers Left Alive is about these two vampires, and it's not your traditional vampire story. It's kind of coming in at the end of the vampire trend, but... <laughs> The vampire's thing is just a metaphor for sort of, it's sort of a metaphor for heroin addiction, but he doesn't get really into that. He kind of gets into these, the, the concept that these, these people have been around for so long that they've seen all of these great people come and go, and, and they have a lot of anger at the injustices that they've seen, and it, it's a, it's a movie built out of a lot of conversations, which is refreshing because Limits of Control, Jarmusch's last film, was very silent and it was kind of like I don't know it might have alienated some of his viewers and I, I liked it but uh, you know I, sometimes I'm back and forth with Jarmish. I mean like I love him he's one of my favorite filmmakers but like I don't I've never been able to finish Dead Man this is only, the only movie I haven't been able to finish I just I tried to watch it like five times but anyway I'm getting off topic all right so number four they came together directed by David Wayne he is uh, my favorite comedy director I always put his movies on my top ten list, like Wanderlust, which was an underrated movie from a few years ago. There's an uh, there's an alternate cut of Wanderlust that's just absolutely surreal and bizarre. But um, uh, oh, uh, they came together as a parody. It, it, on the outside, it's sort of supposed to be a parody of romantic comedies and and, and the tropes and cliches of the genre. But it, it's a lot more surreal than that. David Wayne, he he's. I don't know, he's just the funniest guy in the world. I, I, this movie made me crack up so hard. He directed Wet Hot American Summer, which is in my top ten movies of all time. I mean, I remember seeing this movie in the theater and just laughing so hard that I missed half the dialogue. I had to go see it again the next day. I pulled my friend. I was like, you got to see this movie. And now it's become this cult classic. It's on cable all the time. But um, uh, hopefully they came together. We'll experience the same kind of um, uh, call to claim because it's it's hilarious. Paul Rudd and Amy uh, uh Amy Poehler are the uh, are the leads. So number three, Maps to the Stars. This is David Cronenberg's new film, and it's uh, written by I forgot his name, but he's a novelist who sort of has this acerbic view of Hollywood. And it's uh, he, he he the the writer worked on um, what was that Wild Palms, Oliver Stone's old show from like the nineties. I don't know whatever. Usually when a novelist writes a screenplay, it's really kind of weird and character based. It's like a Richard Price's screenplays, which I I post a blog about that. Um, he's a he's a novelist who's written like Clockers and Mad Dog and Glory and these kinds of scripts are they're more focused on character and mood and tone and just just weird stuff not not so much formula plot stuff and um maps to the stars is is i, I think it's it might be cronenberg's best film I, I loved it um marissa loved it it's it's extremely angry i mean I've, i don't think i've ever seen a movie go after hollywood this this with with such bite i mean it, it is ooh, it's an awesome movie mia wasikowska is in that one too. She's she appears in um, three of the movies on my list. Uh, she's also in uh, Only Lovers Left Alive, and um, uh, John Cusack and Julianne Moore delivers a great performance. And it's probably a better performance than she gives in Still Alice, which she just won a Golden Globe for, and she's nominated for an Oscar. Still Alice is a is a good movie though too. It's not it's not the best movie, but so number two, this was my most anticipated movie of the year. I read the novel. 
before the movie was announced, and I loved the book. I mean, I told my mom to read it, I told Marissa to read it, and um, I mean, I was just like, I ate the book up, and when I found out it was gonna be made by one of my favorite directors, I just like lost my shit, and it was Inherent Vice, and this movie is awesome. I mean, like, I was so anxious to see it that it almost just clouded my, 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 uh, my my vision of it i couldn't interpret i couldn't get a proper response so i had to watch it a few times the screener leaked which was nice before right the day before it released here in theaters we were planning on going but i was like fuck it i gotta watch it at home because i pr i don't like going to the movies like my back hurts i like to pause a movie even if it's a shitty screener copy i'll watch that but um and it, the bottom was cropped and it was bullshit i was like oh my god if the director could see me watching this he'd slap me in the face but um, then last week, the uh, full frame version leaked, so I watched it again because I had to get the full experience. And Inherent Vice, I mean, some critics don't like it, fuck them. Uh, I remember sitting in an empty theater watching The Big Lebowski the day it came out, and um, Inherent Vice has been compared to The Big Lebowski since before it went into production, and um, it's nothing like it. I mean, they have shallow similarities, but um, it's a wild movie, and uh, it's a beautiful movie, and you gotta check it out, it, it's awesome. Anyway, uh, and the number one movie, this one came out of nowhere, I didn't think I was gonna like it, and because I saw that the, the poster art, the graphics, uh, had, were sort of, they were sort of designed to look like the covers of old Philip Roth novels, and I don't really like that when directors try to reference stuff like that, I think it's kind of played out, like that's the whole Grindhouse Tarantino thing, but this movie, Listen Up Philip, is... It's directed by Alex Ross Perry. This is his third movie. It's his first movie with like a real uh, cast, like a real budget. But it still has, it has a real Cassavetes grit to it. And the, the cinematography is amazing by the, you know, the photographer. And um, uh, uh, it's about, Jason Schwartzman plays this guy. He's this young novelist. He's about, his second novel is about to come out. He's like the worst human being alive. And this movie just surprised me with, with shocked me with the things these characters would say. And um, Elizabeth Moss is great in it. And I think maybe Elizabeth Moss's storyline might not be as strong as Phillips and the Phillips older writer. Because I record video on an SD card, I can only record 12 minutes at a time. So anyway, sorry for the jump cut. But um, what was I talking about? Listen Up, Philip. It's a great movie. And um, uh, you should check it out. This guy, he's a rising talent. He's got another movie coming out this year. And um, yeah, it's good shit. But... Um, let me talk about the movie. Fuck what I liked. That's boring, right? The movies that I didn't like. These are the most overrated movies of the year. These aren't the worst movies of the year, but, like, I can't fucking stand these movies. Um, Whiplash. The movie is green and orange. Every single fucking scene is green and orange. I'm like, what, did you have, like, a green light on the guy? I mean, it's so stupid, right? From, like, the look of it, you're like, fuck you. What are you trying to do? David Fincher and Soderbergh combine? It's so embarrassing. And, like, the plot is so predictable. Like, he's like, he's like, drums, come with me. And, like, the other drummer stands up. Like, you know he's talking to the M Miles Teller. Like, what the fuck? Or we can see a movie about the other drummer. And, and then he's like, no, other drummer. Like, every single story beat I saw before it was going to happen. So this is a movie about jazz, right? What the fuck? You can predict every beat before it happens. It just didn't work, right? There's a movie called Memphis, which really captures the blues much better than Whiplash captures jazz. Uh, J.K. Simmons is great in it, don't get me wrong. Whiplash has its merits, but fucking that movie is not the best movie of the year. It's, I, 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 I don't, I, I think I fast forwarded through some of it. Uh, no, I didn't actually. But, um, uh, Birdman, I did. I fast forwarded through the end of Birdman. I couldn't handle this bullshit. This was like, <laughs> like the most annoyingly fake, spontaneous movie I've ever seen. Like, okay, now you're gonna be spontaneous right now. Okay, Michael Keaton, come on, come on, get in your underwear and blah, 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 blah. It was, it's Noises Off. Have you ever seen Noises, you know, Noises Off, that old stupid play about, like, the theater backstage at the theater and everyone's, like, fucking each other? It's like a sex farce. It's, like, so stupid. That's what Birdman is. It's a really dressed up version of Noises Off. And not in a creative postmodern way, but in a, that, Inuratu is just bad, I don't know if I pronounced his name wrong, but he is a terrible filmmaker. He made Babel, Morris Peros, and 21 Grams, three of the shittiest movies of all time. You know those movies where like Brad Pitt is like doing something in Saudi Arabia and like there's another storyline going on and then like the bullet comes through the window and kills his wife and it's the bullet from the kid that we saw from the movie. It's so stupid. It's like the worst genre. Anyway, um, I hate that movie. Birdman sucks. What else sucks? The Theory of Everything. Oh my god, this is the stupidest movie I've ever seen. This is a movie that just, like, it's like, did 
was is Stephen Hawking just like the guy with a disease? Is that who he is? Because that's what the movie sort of portrays. And like the Eddie Redmayne, he just like bugs me. I don't know. He's like. That's Eddie Redmayne. That's my imitation of Eddie Redmayne. Anyway, so um, what else? What else? I'm trying to be quick because I don't I don't want to bore you guys. I probably already have. Okay, this one I'm gonna have everyone hating me for this, but Interstellar is fucking stupid. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I like how um, it, it, uh, Matthew McConaughey Coop. He's like he has to get back to Earth for for Murph for Jessica Chastain. Murph, Murph. I love Murph and poor poor Casey Affleck. What the fuck? His sons like what? He doesn't care about his son like what? Because Murph worked into the plot more. Christopher Nolan focused on that relationship. And then at the end, Coop comes back. He he sits down. He walks into a room with apparently all of his grandchildren, all of these people that he has never met because who who else would be visiting his his daughter on her deathbed? So he comes in, he doesn't look at any of them. He just walks up to her. He's not like, who are you people? Like, oh my God, it's my family that I missed out on. So he sits down and he goes, I was your ghost. Basically, uh, not I love you. Oh my God, I'm so happy to see you. But can you believe that was me that accomplished? He talks about his own accomplishments. And then they, they, they talk. I'm ruining Interstellar, by the way, for people who fucking haven't seen this shitty movie yet. Who cares? But anyway, so like, um, he doesn't even ask about Casey Affleck. It's, it's a joke. I don't know. Maybe if I watch the movie again, he might be like, oh, so how's, how's, how's Casey? And she's like, I don't know. I, I don't know. It might have been just like tossed off in some dialogue, but whatever. Interstellar fucking blows. I hate that movie. I hate all of Christopher Nolan's movies. I mean, Interstellar is actually watchable. I mean, that's the thing that sucks about these these movies is that they're actually they're almost good they're just uh, totally emotionally wrong and you're like fuck you i'm not stupid they insult your intelligence anyway um so anyway a most violent year this movie wants to be the wire this is like such a wire ripoff i'm just like fuck you like you know i mean uh, there's one thing to emulate something like listen up philip sort of tries to talk and he tries to use philip roth's um themes to sort of like you know work its own magic but 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 fucking this movie the uh, most violent year is is the wire dressed up as a movie it's 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 a joke it's stupid you can always tell because there's always one wire actor in the movie and, and this one guy the guy who plays Phelan on the wire he's he's in this movie as a teamster boss a teamster boss so there's unions in, there are unions in this movie and Unions are an important part of the wire. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, so it's about leverage and personal interests, all the themes that the wire is about. The most violent year is a totally hollow um, movie. It's bullshit. Uh, Yodorowsky's Dune. Okay, I used to like Yodorowsky. Like, I think I posted some videos on my old channels about it. By the way, I can't get into those old channels. So if you're wondering why I'm not posting on, like, Ricky Shore, Trippy Shore, or any of that shit, I lost the passwords and Google refuses to let me in. So I don't know, whatever. I would delete a lot of that shit because I don't really like it, but whatever. I don't know what I said. I'm probably wrong, but um, Calvary. I hated this movie. Um, Brendan Gleeson. He's a great actor, but this movie was so unfunny and annoying. It reminded me like a, of like a Christopher Titus routine. Whatever. Um, uh, what else? Force Majeure. The, the, you know what? I kind of liked this movie. Actually, I was on the fence about this one, but like it's on all these critics lists, and like it's so, it's like such a joke. It's 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 Michael Haneke. If you told me, if you were like, if you sat me down, and you're like, this is Michael Haneke's new movie. I'd be watching. I'd be like, this is. <clears throat> This is kind of boring, like, but I would believe you because it's so much like Michael Haneke. It's kind of like when Jason Reitman made Juno and it's like exactly like Wes Anderson and you're like, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, um, <clears throat> obvious child. Oh my God, this annoying girl uh, and her shitty boyfriend who like they run into each other constantly in these little meat cutes and it's, it's the worst movie I've ever seen. I mean, sure, yeah, it's got a great message. Yeah, abortion is should be should be you know every woman's choice but but um uh, uh fuck this movie it's horrible every joke is like a poop joke it just it's not it's not funny at all it's just like so want to be Judd Apatow or some shit I don't know this is another movie that, this is a movie that disappointed me was uh, the skeleton twins I really wanted to like this movie I like Kristen Wiig and I like Bill Hader and Bill Hader's good in the movie I just thought it was just Sundance to death there's just like only a plot there's like nothing that happens outside of this shitty little storyline and it's one of those storylines where you don't know what's going on until it like it like it like kind of like dangles the plot in front of you like where it, and it feeds you facts like you're that's the suspense like what's going on like you're i'd rather see a movie unfold i don't like 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 fargo or something whatever anyway um snowpiercer oh my god i hate this movie this was like battlefield earth to me snowpiercer is like it's like a, it's like what am i watching it, it, it i whatever i don't even want to get into it um 
Yes. Locke. Oh my God. This guy in a car. Tom Hardy in a car. I like Tom Hardy, but it, listening to him talk on the phone. Oh my God. I, I hate the phone. I just, I don't like, I don't like that voice. I, something about it. It's like, like I let like Marissa like do a lot of like, like, if, like we have to call someone like she'll do it because like, it's just like, ugh. anyway. Um, so that Locke is a guy in a car for an hour and a half and it's on all these critics lists and it's, it's it, like, and it's not, it doesn't even have like that, the, the story is annoying, is as annoying as him being in the car, but whatever. Um, St. Vincent, the thing where Bill Murray is, like, making jokes, it's Bad Grandpa, um, it's a sitcom, it's really Catholic, it's shockingly Catholic, I was kind of like, whoa, my god, this movie's really trying to convert me to Catholicism, but, um, uh, that's not why I hated it, I hated it because it was cheesy and obvious and had bad jokes, but, um, some other movies that I liked, these aren't movies that, um, made my top ten list, but, and they're not overrated, but, uh, I liked Big Eyes, Boyhood, Clouds of Sils Maria, Frank, Gloria, Gone Girl, Goodbye to Language, The Grand Budapest Hotel, The Guest. The Guest is a great movie. It almost made my top ten list, but the end is so stupid. It was directed by Adam Wingard, who I didn't really like before, but he made this genre movie last year, and it is. It's, I love it. Anyway, um, Housebound, The Imitation Game, Jauja, Jimmy P, Leviathan, Life Itself, Magic in the Moonlight, Mana Kamana, Memphis, Mr. Turner, our Sunni, Selma, Startup, Thou Wast Mild and Lovely, Violet, We Are the Best, and Why Don't You Play in Hell. And then uh, there were three popcorn flicks this year that were actually pretty decent. I normally don't like superhero movies or big, big budget bullshit movies, but Edge of Tomorrow was amazing. Guardians of the Galaxy was pretty good. It's directed by James Gunn, who fucking wrote Tromeo and Juliet. And Lloyd Kaufman is in Guardians of the Galaxy. You can spot him like in the prison scene. It's pretty funny. But anyway, um, and X-Men Days of Future Past, which had some sequences that when I was sitting in the theater, I was like, but whatever. Uh, yep, so it's, uh, yeah, good to um, post again, and uh, check out my blog for more thoughts on movies, and um, yeah, let me know what you think in the comments. Thanks, guys.